right, guys. Thanks for joining us again today. This is Capital Interactive with your hosts, Adam the Boz and Basim. We got a really special guest today. It's going to be an amazing show. Mark Rafael in Houston uh, here with Farmers Insurance. He's going to tell us a little about uh, his experience, how he grew his business, how he started at a very young age, and kind of some of the really cool things that's happened along the way. So I'm really excited to get to know him a little bit and hear his story. We've been doing some good spotlights on entrepreneurs, and I'm excited to hear Mark's story. Um, Mark, it's great to have you here. Appreciate you joining us today. Excuse me. We're excited to hear more about your story. Awesome. Basim and, and Adam, thank you both for having me. Basim, I think we've known each other probably for about probably six, seven years now. We've kind of uh, started off having coffees and uh, kept touch. And I, I appreciate you having me today. Yeah, man. It's great to see you. Yeah. So uh, I, I love just to give you guys a little background about how I started. And I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs could relate because uh, it's, it's not always what you see on the surface is, is, is what people uh, think. Right. So Long story short, I'll try to condense it. Um, I graduated from Texas A&M University in 2005 in December because my Egyptian parents said, you have to finish school. I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I squeaked out with a history degree, Kines minor, thought I was going to be a basketball coach. But, you know, uh, lo and behold, when you graduate in December, the only job you can get is substitute teaching. And I knew I couldn't make a living doing that. So I threw my name in a hat with a recruiter. And what can a history degree get? Sales jobs. So I got recruited left and right for sales jobs. And I took the first one I can get because, you know, I was living at home. I wanted to prove to my folks and family that, hey, you know, I, I can make something, even though it wasn't the typical, you know, be a doctor, be a lawyer, you know, things like that. So uh, the first job was going door to door, selling phone and internet to small businesses. And I hated it. But I'll tell you what, I uh, learned a lot because I noticed the people that stuck it out were successful and the ones that quit, you know, they fell like flies. So a year and a half, two years later, I found myself, Hey, you know, even though it took, you know, 40 no's to get a yes, that kind of transitioned to any business I thought. So my manager after two years said, Hey, Mark, my dad owns a farmer's insurance agency. He said, I can't work for him until I have sales experience. So we were both fresh out of school. We got the experience. I, I left the corporate job with benefits and went and worked for his dad. And his dad said, we mainly do commercial and small business insurance, but I need you to get your feet wet with people's personal insurance. And they gave me the phone book and I was calling on people I didn't know. And, I, you know, first month didn't make any money. Six, six months, I didn't make any money. One year, I found myself in like 20 grand in credit card debt, dating my wife, now wife. And she had no idea. Um, so I played it off like everything was cool, even though I was struggling. Um, so one of my friends said, hey, Mark, do you need a job? I said, yeah, this insurance thing isn't working out. So I got into oil and gas in 2008, got laid off in 2009, had my license still. So I called Farmer's Corporate Office because I had my license with them. They said, hey, if you want to take a loan out, uh, you have some quotas, you have to so have an office space. Um, and I'm thinking, if you're dumb enough to give a young guy in credit card debt money, I will take it. Mm -hmm. um, but the second time around, I decided, you know what? I really want to brand myself. And I don't want to get mixed up with the other farmer's agent down the block or the other Allstate State Farm. So I really tried to create my own brand website. And I took what I learned from going business to business for phone and internet and transitioned that to doing it for insurance. And nobody was doing that. Um, you know, a lot of times people are, are uh, you know, scared to do things. And for me, I'm thinking, you know, that one minute walking into a door could change your, you know, your life, your month, your week, whatever. So um, I went business to business that first year and did a bunch of small policies. I'm talking people renting a thousand square foot office space, people renting an apartment or condo, because I was living, in, you know, in, in the city and, um but it worked out. The first year in business, we got awarded Farmers Insurance Rookie of the Year. Awesome. And we That's awesome. 450 policies. Half of them were small ones. But what happened was we planted a bunch of seeds and set the expectations that, hey, we want to grow with you. So when that person was ready to move out of that thousand square foot office space into 10,000 or move from a condo to a house, hey, we were riding the wave with them. And uh, I dragged in my, my 
girlfriend and fiance, now wife, into it uh, from the very beginning. And she helped by answering the phones, which allowed me to go out there and meet people. And then uh, my second year, farmers like, hey, you're, you're moving and shaking. Do you want to buy an agency? Uh, we have somebody retiring. We'll help you finance it. I said, yeah. So I bought an agency. And what a lot of people do is they take that revenue and they sit on it. And the, the customers don't get the service that they need. So I decided take the revenue and hire somebody. So I hired uh, Nancy Flannery. She's my uh, first person I, I hired on a credit card, essentially. Uh, but now she's celebrating almost 11 years with me. So she celebrated awesome. a 10 year anniversary with me yep. and stuck it out with me. Uh, so fast forward. So now um, I, I use that rookie of the year accolade to, to approach people in commercial real estate and residential real estate. And, and said, you know, we've tailored our operation around people like the scene. Like if we weren't, we wouldn't be in business if it wasn't for our referral partners. So we try to sponsor organizations like the Houston Association of Realtors, uh, Commercial Real Estate uh, Network, um, and the Women's Council. Of Real We're involved with about 10 organizations at some capacity. And our mantra is you got to give to receive. And uh, we really take pride in communicating well because I don't want to be the bad guy if something happens. So um, fast forward now, we're 11 years in business. We service over 4,000 insurance policies. Uh, we were awarded the Houston Chronicles Best Insurance Agency in 2020. And that's uh, awesome. Congrats. I put a few accolades here. You know, part of the Heights Chamber of Commerce. Where we've had, and I'll screen share and show you some of these things. We have articles written about our agency. Um, and then actually years ago, I got asked to partner with top agents around the country to write a chapter about my experience. Um, and I, we wrote a book with Brian Tracy. I don't know if you can see that. He's the famous guy, not me. But the fact that I got to write a chapter and it kind of gave us some credibility. So um, that's kind of how we started. Uh, but now my focus today is my, uh, we have a staff of eight people. Um, I mainly handle all the commercial insurance, the life insurance for those business owners. Maybe they have buy-sell agreements or uh, want key employee coverage. And then I will, I think the difference is I don't look at any client from a revenue standpoint. I, I will treat everybody the same. And my staff will offer a meeting, Zoom meeting like this with every client, whether they're in a one bedroom apartment or they're doing $10 million in revenue. And I think that's what separates us. Yeah. Well, you know, you said a lot of really interesting stuff there. And I want to kind of go back to the beginning because the thing that's shot out in my mind right away was the year of no sales when you first started. Man, what were you thinking when you get through one month, two months, three months, and you haven't had like significant sales? Tell us a little bit about that thought process, because I think that it's, um, you know, very rare that somebody's going to be able to uh, stick it out that much. You know, I, sh I think it shows a special type of character of somebody that's willing to do it. And tell me what kind of things you try to do to change your outcome during that period of time. Like, what, like, did you try a whole bunch of different things that this isn't working? Let's try something else. Give us a little bit of a, a, a dig in about that first year when you're getting rejections. Yeah, no, great question, Basim. I, I really had a, a big picture vision knowing that um, if I had little wins, it would turn into big wins. So, you know, if somebody was moving into an office space and their, their, you know, annual premium is a thousand dollars, well, guess how much money an insurance agent makes? They make 10%. So I make a hundred dollars. Well, guess what? That referral came from somebody. I'm giving them $25 gift card for thinking of me. And then I'm, I'm thinking that's a win. And then I just planted the seed. So I, I think, you, you got to treat the small wins um, as big as the big wins, uh, because a lot of times people will be like, gosh, that's only made $50, right? I'm trying to go out there and make the big bucks, right? But I, I, I had a vision where if, if I do a lot of small wins, it will compound. And in the insurance world, you know, I heard this saying before, you are going to be severely underpaid in the beginning, but when you're older, you're going to be overpaid because most people won't stick it out, you know, to, for the long haul. So I just kept yeah. 
That's a good point. Having that vision. Uh, and that's what kept pushing me through. And then the other thing is family, friends and things like that. I felt like, uh, you know, they were rooting for me, but at the same time they were had their doubts. And I was like, I, I want to not have any naysayers and I wanted to push through and I want to prove my, to myself, you know? So for, for me, if my name was on it, it, it didn't matter how much money I was making. It was all about the reputation, how you communicate, you know, because bad news spreads faster than good news, sadly. So, you know, you can do 10 good things and then you do one bad thing. Guess what? Everybody's going to whisper and talk about it. So I was like, you know what? I just want to shoot people straight, be transparent, communicate well, be professional and just hope that everything falls into place. And I think in business, it, it, it's really no secret. If you do things the right way, even though you don't make the money that you want or the revenue you want, your reputation will come and there's going to be some good karma around that. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it was just pushing through and, and, and not giving up. It, it's simple, yet so complicated, not giving up. <laughs> if you believe in it, right? If you believe in what you're doing, because there's, there's going to be times where you're doing something and you know it doesn't feel right. It's not right. And if you don't believe in it, that, that's a different story. And credit cards helped a lot, Basim. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, no, I mean, and, and, and you say something that's been a recurring theme with a lot of the guests that we've had on the show. And it, it, it's twofold. It's, it's hard work and it's, it's a numbers game. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, when you said when you were uh, doing door-to-door sales for, you know, uh, internet and, and so on and so forth, it might be one out of 40, but you got to put in the time. You got to put in the numbers to actually start to even gain some momentum in some success. And then you also had the, you know, forward thinking ability, you know, once you left insurance to take that mentality of the, the door-to-door sales and apply that to your insurance business. I think that was, uh, that was very, you know, thinking outside the box coupled with hard work. Yeah. And another thing I, I thought about when we, you know, me and Adam talked about this a lot in the past, kind of amongst ourselves is, you know, it's kind of defining success whenever you're going out for sales. And so sometimes what I think people need to do. And you tell me if you did this whenever you were having experiencing that gear is, you know, I would define a win differently. If I'm out there cold calling and not getting anything, I might define a win as what piece of information did I, can I gather this time around? That's going to, that's going to, you know, propel me towards the win in the long run. And so, you know, it's not always that I close a deal. It's like, what, what did I gain from this particular interaction? That's going to help the long run. And so a lot of times I think shifting the focus when you're having a lot of uh, rejection uh, just to like on, on smaller wins and just this, you, helps you see the progress and helps you kind of uh, continue on. I mean, did you think along that lines at all whenever you were working on it? Yeah, no, absolutely. Basim, because uh, let's be honest, um, we all tend to get down whenever things aren't working out, but then you kind of snap into reality and you realize, you know what? Um, every no gets you one step closer to the yes. Mm-hmm. And if, uh, if everybody can do it, everybody would be doing it. Yeah. So now I just look at it as like, yeah, it, it's, it, you're right. It's a numbers game, but also treating everybody the same. And something I learned in the early years when I was going, you know, door to door is I would treat the receptionist as if she was the owner, because mm-hmm. you never know, it could be the owner's wife up there, you know? <laughs> sure. Yeah. But, we do the but, same, you know, believe it or not though, when I was trained in telecom, uh, we would role play and stuff like that. And their role play model was to kind of shun the, the reception. She'd go in there and say, Hey, you know, my name's Mark. I'd like to talk to the owner. Thanks. And you turn around and you walk. away. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, how does that work? So I'd go in and how are you? Small talk, you know, just want to right. introduce myself. And if, you know, if I got some swag, I'm going to give it to him. Absolutely. <laughs> you know what? Hey, it's my husband back there. You know, uh, and he's the owner. So uh, I, I would say uh, don't judge a book by its cover because sure. my biggest client is the guy in boots and mud out in Katy, you know, so um, that, that's that got 70 employees and it's a large landscaping distribution company deep in Katy. This guy started his business from the ground up from Mexico, not knowing a lot of English, but you know what? Now he's, he's my biggest client, probably spending close to $400,000 a year on his insurance. Yeah. And it's because I treated him with respect, whereas the other guy in the suit and tie is coming in and, you know, shutting him off. He might not be, he'll be like, where's the owner? 
It's like, I am yeah. the man, you know, like, yeah. hey, uh, you said it earlier. You had your, uh, your fiance, your now wife answering the phone for you while you were out. So, I mean, yep. it's just a perfect example of, you know, the business owner having a family member at the front desk yeah, or, you know, cause those are the people that are going to wear every single hat until the business gets you yeah. know, built up well, in every hat. <laughs> we, we often find, you know, that receptionist, that front line, um, of defense is, is exactly that they're, they're there to, to screen who comes in, who goes out. And, um, and oftentimes if you can uh, get in good with them, I mean, you can at least get in. It's not, it might not be a yes, but you know, they're, they're there to, to filter and sift through what's coming through that door. Like dumb and dumber. So, so you're saying there's a shot so right? there's more like there's one in a million. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Tell us a little bit about, you know, let's go shift there to the family dynamic a little bit. How, cause uh, you know, how, first of all, did you find a woman like that? That's going to uh, meet you when you're, you know, haven't made a sale in a year, $20,000 on a credit card and, and she's sticking with you. You must've found a diamond in the rough there. And then tell us about how it's been working in a, you know, having family in the business and having that family dynamic it, you know, at work? Great question. And, you know, there's a reason our office is in the complete opposite sides of the office, right? No, no, no. But to be honest with you, um, she had faith in me. And I, I think that that's how I knew she was the one. Like, if she's with me when I have nothing, imagine, you know, when we do make something out of, uh, out of this business. So, um, but at the same time, we, you know, she's on one side, I'm on the other side of the office and our team members are in the middle. And they see the way we operate and it really is professional, respectful. And, you know, at the same time have a human element of fun. Right. Um, so are there ups and downs? Absolutely. When you're at the dinner table and you bring up, you know, Hey, uh, you know, I was talking about, the, I was talking to Basim today and I'll, you know, it naturally comes up and kind of becomes part of, you know, uh, your life. However, we, we kind of made a, you know, we try to separate as much as we can. And before we had kids, you know, it was six days a week. Uh, but then once we had kids, it's like, you know what, I've got to be the, the nine to five thirty guy. I got to be home for dinner and, and really have that work life balance. So, um, it seems, let me do this. Let me sh screen share. If you, if you guys don't mind, Go ahead. Go for it. show you, this is a snapshot of our team. Um, a list of services you see from commercial, personal life to different vehicles, commercial uh, vehicles. And uh, when I say we try to make it fun, yeah, you know, hey, we're, we're, we're professional, but same time, hey, there, there's a softer side, right? Um, and now by being involved with organizations, that gives your business credibility and leverage to all those members. So I would say for the last seven years, you know, the first three years of building credibility and being to be able to afford to be part of these organizations. Now, here's just some businesses that we uh, ensure that we like to uh, spotlight Urban Eats, Heights AC, uh, Intero Real Estate, Salada Franchises, uh, organizations, you know, the Houston Association of Realtors, Greater Heights Chamber, CREN, Young Lawyers Association, this is commercial real estate for millennial misses, millennial misses. So it's a woman's organization. And believe it or not, you know, you think about commercial real estate, you think primarily this, it's a male driven industry. And this is a, a group of, of young professional women that we, that's a client of ours actually too. And we insure these organizations actually. Um, but I also want to show you just a quick snippet of a 30 second video that I thought was cool. When, when we were awarded the Houston Chronicles Best Insurance Agency, I wanted to put a billboard up and let everybody know that we we're out there. So I put this billboard up off 59. I want y'all to see our 30 second commercial that we put together.
Awesome. Yeah, we didn't really get the that's great. audio on that, but I'm gonna put a link so people can um sure. check it out on their own. But yeah, that's awesome. You know, you guys do a great job. You know, I've worked with you guys on some some uh, insurance stuff before, so I know you really take care of your clients, and it's a big thing to you. And I know that you're involved in the community, and and I don't want people to get, get that impression that you're doing this just to grow your business because I know you you've been involved in a lot of nonprofit stuff, including like um, the Egyptian uh, festival here in Houston. And that wasn't something that you made any money on. That was something that was actually a big drain on you. So, and I, and it, you, you brought the whole community together downtown, had people from all kinds of cultures coming in and, and experiencing a North African uh, culture. And you brought people in from uh, Egypt to, uh, to sing and all kinds of stuff. So tell us a little bit about that, your involvement in the community, because I know it's a really big part of your life and, and how uh, and how you kind of integrate that and find time for that when you're doing so much at, at work as well. Yeah, Basimi, you're one of the uh, main supporters whenever I was had the crazy idea. So I, I'm first generation Egyptian, you know, my parent and so is my wife. You know, they, they came here and had nothing. My dad worked at Jack in a Box. My mom worked at Kmart. Uh, I saw them hustle. So that was another thing. I was like, when I start to work, I want to be able to take care of them. And I think that's what makes an entrepreneur a little different. Like they're not just trying to take care of them. They're trying to take care of maybe generations and things like that. So uh, when I was younger, the first Egyptian Orthodox church is in Bel Air and we used to have a festival. And I remember all the, you know, everybody having fun congregating, but 20 something years ago, it was just too many moving parts and church said no more. So then I go to the Greek festival and I see, you know, everybody having a blast. I open up their pamphlet and I see, you know, hey, I, I see the, 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 the farmer's guy, the construction guy. I see all these advertisers and they're all Greek. And I'm thinking, you know, we can do something like this. So then I asked the Egyptian community, hey, what do you think if we, we try to start an Egyptian festival? And everybody's like, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea, Mark. You know, good idea. Um and then I was like, well, would you guys support me if I did it? And I had a, few, a handful of people say yes. Well, um, so I started calling around and I tried to put the pen to the pad and figure out how much I thought it would be. And I was nowhere even close. Um, and I was like, gosh, why does anybody want to call me back? I'm calling these parts. So I just got fed up and I walked to Discovery Green. I said, how much does this place cost? They're like, you can have that little corner for 10 grand. I was like, 10 grand, how much do you need? Uh, they're like, $1,000 down, 10%, and we can book it a year from now. So I'm thinking, you know what? I'm probably spending a couple thousand dollars supporting organizations and sponsoring stuff. Let me be the main sponsor, and I bet you I can get other sponsors. And it can't be more than 10 grand if I add, you know, some music and all this stuff. It ended up costing about $55,000. I had to borrow money. I had to, uh, it, you know, it, it, and here's the other thing about business. When, when you don't have money, it makes you become scrappy, right? Uh, you'll hear that word from me, at least. I've heard it from others. You make do with what you got. You take advantage of the resources that you have, and you try to make do, with, you know. Um, and what happened was the Egyptian consulate called me, and they said, who the hell are you? Not in those words, but, you know, who are you? Why are you doing this? And I told him, you know what? We don't have anything to showcase our culture. I thought it'd be a good idea to do something because when you watch the news, it was bombing here, people, you know, religious persecution there. And I'm thinking, you know what? If we could unite, what, no matter the religious background, where you're from, we can do something special. And in that regard, it, it united some of the Islamic community and the, the Christian community. And that was the beautiful part about it. So the Egyptian consulate then calls the, the Egyptian government and they decide to fly in belly dancers. Mm -hmm. uh, they flew in an Egyptologist. They helped me uh, connect with Egypt air to raffle tickets. And I had to get creative with advertising because I had sponsors kind of step up. I had loans and all this, and we charged $10 a ticket. And we actually made $70,000 that day in 2016. Oh. Now I had, I paid off the 55. I donated about 10 of it to nonprofits. And then I took the leftover five and gave it to an attorney and said, look, can you make us a nonprofit? We became a nonprofit in 2017. I had a board, but that second year, I found myself 
kind of like the first year, spending 10, 15 hours a week for a year planning this citywide event. The Greeks have a congregation, hundreds of people. It was me, my wife, and a handful of people. So the second year the Astros played, Hurricane Harvey happened. I doubled expenses and we were 25 grand in the red. Hmm. So I had to know when to fold, right? And I told the community, I was like, look, we don't have Exxon like the the uh, the Japanese festival and they have Toshiba and all. I was like, I'm out there scrapping, trying to make it happen. So I was like, guys, I have to respectfully step down. But I'll tell you what, I thought that was a failure. But today, gosh, it's four years later. I'm still doing business with people and connections that I made. So don't, this is what I learned and I hope others will. Don't look at a failure as a failure. Look at it as what you can learn to pivot your growth. And that's exactly what happened. So the same, I'm going to, and, and Adam, I'm just going to show you a few seconds of the first Egyptian festival, because honestly, uh, I had the vision with others and um, I thought it would be like renting a small park and having a couple hundred people to, it was the biggest Egyptian festival probably recorded with over 5,000 people in year one. So I haven't touched the website since 2016, uh, 2017, but I'll let you see a few seconds of the first one. Oh, wow. That's huge. Yeah, I was there. We had a great time. It was great. All kinds of good food. So um, let me come back here. Now, when you talk about getting scrappy, guys, let's look at these sponsors. So I was the main sponsor. I had somebody volunteering graphic design and stuff like that. I traded him to be a sponsor. Egypt Air traded to be a sponsor. The consulate, get you know, they gave it, they were pushing it out on their channels to promote it. Same with these magazines, right? Hey, come out. I'll let you set up a booth. Uh, we'll put you as a sponsor. Put us in your magazine. Eighth Wonder, they made an Egyptian beer that day and called it Pharaoh's Brew. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> so, awesome. you know, what I learned is if you can, if you can bring in other organizations and tie your name to them, you're getting some credibility that I called the museum. They have the Egypt exhibit. Yeah. They traded 50 tickets. So we're on stage saying, you know, get tickets and boom, I trade them for a sponsorship. Same with the radio. Hey, I called them, gave them tickets. They put it on air. Now, 104 KRBE, I got in and they, they gave me a little segment. And that's how I kind of learned about being on the news. So this actually put me on on channel uh let me go to this gallery real quick channel 11 and the billboard i had a billboard for one month guys because i had to get scrappy and i took that billboard connection and guess how i got my billboard years later right, <laughs> <Very good>. okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> so um and here's what i learned if if I take that billboard like mo like Target, they're going to keep that billboard for 12 months and they're going to spend 10,000 bucks a month for it. Well, guess what? If I'm in between Target and Walmart's ad and there's a one month gap, they just want to sell the space. So then I get the space for half the cost for one month, but then you boost it on social media. Now everybody thinks you got a billboard up and you're legit, right? So it's building some credibility. This was Spanish TV. I, you know, I had a connection for Spanish TV. So, um, and then really quick, I'm going to go back to community involvement. You mentioned it, Basim. So I'm, I'm involved in my daughter's elementary school. This is uh, uh, for abused pets. They, they, this is a nonprofit we ensure that got, I got connected with from the Egyptian festival. Same with Crime Stoppers. So the executive director of Crime Stoppers, her name is Rania Mankarios. She's Egyptian. So when I said, you know, I want to give back to nonprofits and you're Egyptian, I'm Egyptian. Let's do this. Let's let's see if we can give the proceeds to Crime Stoppers. Well, guess what? Now, Crime Stoppers is going to go on their platform and talk about the festival. So you're leveraging these relationships. And then Soaring Kids, this is small, grassroots. My friend started it for special needs kids to play sports. 
I've always been involved with that because to me, that's like near and dear to me, you know, and, uh, and we're still involved with, with soaring kids and, and, and give every year to these. So we donate a lot because I know I wouldn't be in business if it wasn't for people like you. So it's only right to give back. Um, it's good karma. Yeah. So I know I've been yapping, but I, it, you're, you're seeing how it kind of all intertwines. Um, no, I, I really like and I appreciate um, that that uh, all that information, all those wonderful stories, Mark. But uh, the, one of my takeaways, and I think it's so important for um, not just business owners or entrepreneurs, but you know, people in general, is a failure is not necessarily a failure. And I very much appreciate learning from what may be constituted as a failure. That's debatable because I think that was highly successful. And, and kudos to you for doing that. But taking. Um, not only your victories in life, but even maybe small defeats along the way and flipping it on its ear and learning something from it. I mean, the, the amount of connections you made from just this uh, Egypt fest was uh, phenomenal. And that's, that's uh, you know, that's paying it forward and, uh, you know, longstanding relationships. So I really appreciate that view on things and, and taking a negative and making it a positive. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. So Mark, uh, tell us a little bit about kind of what your plans are for the future kind of you've grown this to a successful business you've been in business what 13 14 years now and uh i would say close to 12 but yeah you're, i've been an agent licensed agent for about 13 14 and but with my own office close to 12 Okay, great. So you've been doing this a while. <clears throat> you've had starting to have some success. I mean, really you started this at a very young age. I, I mean, uh, for an entrepreneur to start in the early twenties, basically, you know, it's like, and, and you've got a lot of success kind of, where do you see your business going from here? What's your vision for the next 10, 20 years? You know, great question, Basim. So our office is centrally located in upper Kirby. Um, and we were about seven, eight team members. Generally uh, my goal is to, to get up to about 20 team members. Um, and, you know, I, I'd like to have maybe a suburb satellite office. Mm -hmm. However, um, I, I don't want to get too big, but I, I think 20 team members is a nice size. Um, so I, I would say within the next, you know, probably five to seven years that that's going to be my, my goal. And right now we service about 4,000 insurance policies. My goal is to get it to 10,000. Um, and, you know, Right now, I, I'm in the business, and uh, you know, because there's a lot of agents that take this uh, mentality of I'm a business owner, sure, right? and I, I don't deal with the clients. I, you know, maybe I have an office manager, I deal with them, and they manage the office. But for me personally, my name is on everything, and I feel like you hired an insurance agent, so that insurance agent needs to be there for you whenever you need. So I do treat it like a doctor's office and we offer annual re reviews with our business and personalized clients. And to me, uh, that's what separates us. No matter how big we get, I still want to remember where I started and I will, tr you know, I will have the conversation with the, with, with the 21 year old that's starting his life. Um, and, and, you know, so um, I, I envision growing, but still being somewhat in the business Um but, you know, being able to delegate a little bit more uh, over time. Well, and is that what you meant as well? And I'll, I'll let you dive uh, deeper into this. But you and I were talking earlier and, and you mentioned something that all insurance is not the same. And it's a very simple comment. But is that to a degree what you're hitting on? It's, it's, it's the, still the care and service that you provide without getting, you know, uh, above your skis, without having too much of an ego. All insurance is not the same, be it business, be it personal. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, Adam, thanks for bringing that up. So um, I would say on, on the personal end, we'll start with that. And I'll talk, you know, to me, the three probably most important insurance policies are not expensive, they're not brought up and they could ruin somebody financially. And to me, those three policies are one flood insurance in Houston and greater mm -hmm. Houston. Yeah. Most people say, Hey, I'm not in a flood zone. Well, um, if you look at people that did flood, uh, call it after Harvey, after normal storms with construction being on the Gulf coast and being a heavily populated city with concrete jungles going up in eight and 10 lane freeways, um, 
everybody technically is in a flood zone. However, they coin it as low risk and high risk. The low risk, you don't have to get it, but 50% of the floods, almost about, about 50% occur in the low risk areas. So FEMA really can't put a fine line and say, you don't flood here, you don't flood there. So in my opinion, if you're going to take out, uh, you know, if you're going to buy a house, rent an apartment, own an office building, even be a tenant in an office building, the, the biggest exclusion on every policy is flooding. Why? Because it's our biggest exposure. And a lot of people don't know it's $572 a year in most cases um, for, a, uh, for a home. And if it's a commercial property, you can go up to $500,000 on your commercial property for about $2,500 a year. It's a FEMA price. They're the only ones willing to step in and cover you. And the reason I bring that up is because insurance A might not even, uh, company A might not even bring that up. And then now you've ruined somebody's life because they got to take out a second mortgage to gut their house. And now they're paying two notes for the rest of their life. So flood insurance, the second thing is umbrella insurance. You know, people think, hey, I got full coverage. My car's total. I got $1,000 deductible, $500 deductible. I'm on my way. Reality is your phone dings. You look down for 30 seconds. You hit a bike rider. Now somebody's in the hospital or God forbid somebody passes away. Lawyer's going to sue for a couple mil. I can't say a million dollar umbrella policy is going to take care of everything. But if you have a house, you have assets, even you don't have to drive a Mercedes. You can be an average Joe. An umbrella policy might run you 30 to 50 bucks a month, but it is the cheapest lawyer you can get. And why would you not want to be covered for the big stuff? You know, you're spending all this money on insurance. And then the one time something serious happens, you're coming out of pocket because most of the time people are driving around with guess what? State minimum liability or a hundred grand in liability, but their house is worth 300. They got retirement savings. Their assets are way more. And if you're a business owner, you might as well look at two or 3 million because it doesn't cost that much. Um, so an umbrella is like your lawyer on retainer. And for Basim, for example, we talked plenty. He's got rental properties. Guess what? When you hit little Timmy on a bike and a lawyer says, we're going after everything. The first thing to go is your rental property, right? Um, and, and if you don't have the money to pay the medical bill for somebody or somebody passes or they can't walk the same, you can't put a dollar amount on that. Somebody mm -hmm. might say that's worth a couple mil. If you don't have the money, then your credit can be ruined for the rest of your life and you have a lien and you can never buy anything again. So putting it in that perspective, I, I think helps people say, well, gosh, I had no idea what an umbrella is. I had no idea it was only 30, 50 bucks a month. Or I had no idea flood insurance is a couple hundred bucks a year. And then the last thing is life insurance. It's not as black and white as people think. And a lot of times people think I've got it through work, so I'm covered. But if you got one to three times your annual salary and you realize that work benefits aren't yours, the second you leave, poof, they go away. Having your own insurance while you're young and healthy is very important. Because as soon as you get diagnosed with something, you're red flagged. What's the rule of thumb? If you make X per year, and you have dependents or a mortgage, or you want to replace your income, at least till your kids are out of the house and pay off your debts. You add up those numbers, guys, it's going to be a million bucks, at least most of the time. So to me, flood, umbrella, and life insurance, personally and business-wise, are very important, and they're not talked about. Hey, Mark, one more policy that I wanted to ask you about, which I think is becoming more and more important, and I think a lot of people aren't really discussing is kind of like identity theft and cybersecurity protections. Can you just very briefly touch on that? I mean, I know it can get into a long subject, but just real briefly, because I think that's something that I'm seeing a lot of business owners and individuals buy now. And I think it's really smart as well. Yes, sir. So to pivot to the business side, when I go to insurance services, I click on commercial guys. Cyber liability is very important right here. Let's say, for example, you've got thousands of emails, you have people's personal information, your system gets hacked by the, the Facebook guru guy that's in his dorm room. Now they've got people's personal information. You are on the hook. So if your system gets hacked, if somebody shoots an email out from, you know, your email address telling people, pay this $50,000 invoice or whatever, you're on the hook guys. So cyber liability, uh, 
you know, most of the time people say, I need general liability. General liability is somebody gets hurt uh, ac- or, or you damage something accidentally. So in this day of age, Basim, you're absolutely right. You got real estate transactions with wire fraud. Hey, I saw an email from your bank. I, I, right. I sent 250,000 bucks. They're like, uh, that wasn't me. Yeah. Well, who's on the hook, right? So you, you made a really good point. And then the other uh, types of insurance on the business side that I like to bring up is business interruption. I'm sure you guys heard about it during COVID. Yeah, especially um, COVID, yeah. So uh, when I was in school, I, I was a waiter. I hustled. I got by waiting tables. So I, I know the restaurant industry um, and I feel for them. But the key to business interruption is property damage has got a trigger to cover the interrupt. So if I have insurance on my restaurant, and there's a fire and I, it takes me a year to rebuild. Guess what? Business interruption re- reimburses the lost revenue. And if it takes you a year to find another place to rebuild, at least you can keep your managers on staff, pay your mortgage or your rent and not bell and go belly under. Now, uh, so the key was property damage. And a lot of times people said, hey, I see on a policy, it says civil authority. If the government says we got to shut down, why isn't it covered? Well, under that fine print, it says, if let's say, for example, a transformer blows up next to your office and the government says, hey, there's something toxic, Everybody's got to shut down within a three mile radius for three weeks. Okay. There was property damage triggered. It causes the contract to kick in and you can get reimbursed lost revenue. So the other forms of business interruption uh, it can, could be if, you know, let's say a health department shuts you down uh, or the power goes out um, for over eight hours. Th- there's different types of business interruption for different industries, but sadly, it's not a farmer's thing, state farm, nationwide. This is an industry thing where COVID is something new to everybody. And, it, and, and if insurance companies were to give business interruption for th- th- this scenario, guess what? Everybody would go out of business because they weren't rating for that from the get-go. Now, do I feel like over time, maybe there's going to be some options for it? Yes, but is it going to be pretty expensive because you're asking the insurance company to reimburse, even though there was no really damage to your property, no claim. Yeah. So this is new to everybody. Um, and but seeing this is probably where you come in, you know, helping with the loans and the PPPs and things like that to, you know, if it weren't for you guys in the banking world, there's a lot of businesses that wouldn't be around. So uh, kudos to you guys um, for, for helping in that regard. But, but great question to um, well, kind of one of the last topics I wanted to uh, talk about before we wrap up today is something that you kind of mentioned in passing, but it's a it's a topic that we've talked about with multiple entrepreneurs, and so I'd like to get a little bit more depth of uh, your thoughts on it, and that's the use of leverage to grow your business. So you mentioned a couple of times that you actually borrowed money. I think it sounded like it was from State Farm to grow your business. We've had discussions with some business owners that are not as uh, big on borrowing money. Some of them think that it's a great way to accelerate. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on, on borrowing money to grow your business and how that helped you or, or accelerated your business growth. Yeah, Vasim, uh, if it wasn't for people like you in the banking world, I, I wouldn't be in business, right? You gave me the first loan I needed to get by the first year, helped me finance a, an agency uh, my third year. And fast forward now, we've purchased four insurance agencies of agents that have retired. And I'm thinking, gosh, how hard did that person work to build that business? And for me to come in and buy it, to me, it's, it's, it's priceless. But now I've got to then nurture those clients. And, and if you have, you know, when you acquire a business, if you're going to take better care of them than the previous, then you're going to win. But if you're going to acquire the business just because, oh, it's going to generate more revenue, but you're not going to give those clients the, the service that they, they need, guess what? Slowly but surely, they're going to leave. And then that investment may not be worth it. So uh, I think when you make uh, an investment in anything, you get really got to have the vision to put the say, you know what? This will grow my business. I will turn, you know, uh, I'll make a dollar out of 15 cents, right? You know, so um, 
And, and, and in the insurance world, let's say, for example, you know, and this is probably common to many industries. Let's say I, I invest a dollar to make a dollar. Gosh, you're like, you broke even. You didn't make anything, right? And timed. But you know what? The next year, that dollar turns into two. Then the next year, that dollar turns into three. So in the long haul, and it's hard. It's really hard to say, gosh, I'm going to make money on this in three, five, ten years. We don't have the patience for that, right? Yeah. But for me, I'm like, you know what? If I don't lose, I'm okay. I'd rather break even, lose a little if I know I'm going to make it the following year, the year after. So having some patience uh, and having a big picture vision is the way I've mentally been able to overcome writing, you know, signing off on those documents whenever you see, gosh, this is another loan. But um, if it wasn't for those loans, I would not have been able to hire my staff, would not have been able to confidently sponsor all these organizations to leverage those relationships for our business. Well, that's, that's some great feedback. Um, I mean, we really appreciate your time today, Adam, you want to, you want to kind of wrap us up here? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Mark, thank you for the time. Thank you for the words of wisdom. I think you, you gave a lot of good, you know, content and points out there. Uh, we want to share some links in the description. So look for some of those links as it pertains to, uh, so some of the videos we talked about earlier, the book, um, once again, Mark, thanks for the time. As always, it's Capital Interactive with the Sim and the Boz. Uh, appreciate your time today. If you have a lot, if you find a lot of value in these videos, please like, subscribe to the videos, uh, and we'll see you next time. Peace. Thank you, guys. Great job.